Before I go any farther in this sutta, I'd like to explain the preliminaries to it, and it might be important to get the context. This sutta was given to monks, and the monks were staying in a forest that they had not been in before. Beautiful forest, very inviting. Pine trees and white sand and things like that, lovely. And they experienced some difficulties and problems. They seemed to have invaded the space without much consideration of the other beings that lived there. And these beings are somewhat uh, difficult to define, but they were experiencing some disconcerting events, visions, and what seemed to be harassments from an invisible world around them. Just bad vibes, basically. So they, they were perplexed and they consulted with each other and they all had been having these experiences. So they went to see the Buddha and he said, you know, you kind of barged into some other beings' territories. And so here's the solution for this. Here's how to make this a uh, more or less pleasant experience for everybody and all of the beings around you. And also to get some protection in, in a, from any kind of harassments like this. So this is the roots, the history of this sutta. So it is given specifically to monks. And so if you think perhaps that monks spend all their time just contemplating anicca, dukkha, anatta, the impermanence, suffering, and selflessness, here is the Buddha giving explicit instructions to monks. And the sutta, as we move on, you will see that it results in uh, very high, it is the foundation for very high insights eventually. So he gave them this, this sutta. And so this preliminary instruction is not just for anybody, but it's for, for monks. And you can extrapolate this to the lay person's life. And you'll have to adapt it to be appropriate to the layperson's life. So we shall continue with the next uh, uh, qualities that one has to develop in order to support this structure of loving kindness, because it's not isolated from the rest of your personality structures, your views on life, your attitudes towards life. So we had just finished being peaceful and calm. And by the way, I think, uh, just think of the situation. There would be animals, aside from the invisible world, there's the visible world or quasi-visible world of animals. You remember this is in the fifth century BC and they're, they're living in the forests. I, even now in the, in the 21st century, I've, and, also in the 20th century. <laughs> I've spent a good deal of time living in forests as a monk. And forests perhaps have changed a little bit, but still there are, they're full of uh, wild animals, both in Asia and where we are here in Canada. And there's a continuous interaction with these animals. And some people are very nervous around animals, and the, and the more nervous and aggressive you get around animals, the more nervous and aggressive they get around you. And so this is advice also for dealing with those other beings, including, of course, humans. You can enter, as a monk, I've had this experience certainly in the West, and it can happen even in Asia where you, you just arrive in, a, in an area and start, take up your residence, and people find you not certain who you are, or what you're up to, and they can be suspicious and aggressive and all of these things. So this is also for monks that you need to conduct yourself, you know, the, the very expression on your face, how you walk, how you interact, how you speak to anybody and everybody also reduces the tension 
in uh, your interaction with other beings. So this is very important to understand that you're radiating this out, not just mentally, but also in every motion you make, in every micro expression of your face, in the tone of your voice. All of these things are being read by other beings. This uh, intuitive capacity to read other beings is part of everybody's evolution. If you can't read other beings, whether they're going to be dangerous to you or not, then you won't survive very long. So there's a highly developed sense of awareness and interaction with other beings that uh, is, you need to be aware that the beings have this and that you can communicate in certain ways and diffuse the situation. You can stop trouble before it starts. So the monks, which went to this beautiful area, had not been considerate. They had not been mindful of their how they moved and spoke, talked, and so forth. And so this is what they they were being instructed to do. And this is this is not just you know in the forest someplace. This is also in your in your relationships to other beings uh, and other people as well. So this is what is meant by peaceful and calm. And then wise and skillful. Wise and skillful, wise is that you're wise enough to listen and attend to the directions. Wisdom is also that you are, what are you up to? You're attempting to diffuse your natural tendencies to anger and greed and the five hindrances. This is, uh, wisdom is the idea that you're going to diffuse these and um, not, not simply act on them, that your motivations have changed. So you are wise and you are skillful, so you're learning the skills. And we talked about it a bit before about the nature of speech, for instance. Skill in speech is very, very demanding and if you remember how the optimal mode of being skillful in speech is that you have to get your emotions in the right uh, direction. So if you can get the heart in the right space, then you will be more skillful in all kinds of activities of life. So the, the, the last couple of qualities not proud and demanding in nature. This uh, would be amongst the, the monks themselves, and this uh, also applies to your regular associates if you're at work, in whatever order of the hierarchy at work you are in, whatever the structure in your family. And, and of course, this happens with monks as well. Like there, You have an order of seniority and various things. So the Buddha is encouraging these monks not to be to act in a proud or demanding nature. As far as the demanding, it's really to do perhaps more with the uh, lay people. So the monks depend on the lay people for their, their alms, their, their food, sometimes their robes and medicine and shelter, uh, etc. So they should be very um, non-demanding. Monks, uh, sometimes monk, it's said that monks, you know, people say, oh, monks go begging every day. Well, we, <laughs> monks don't go begging every day. Why do monks rely on the lay people at all? Why don't they just become farmers, <laughs> hermits? Some orders of monks do, and not in the Buddhist orders, but in, the, say, Catholic orders and so forth. They, they just maintain themselves. They have their own livelihoods, etc. Why don't Buddhist monks do that? Because the Buddha asked them not to, very importantly, not to become independent. That's a very interesting position to be put in, is not to seek independence. A lot of humans like to seek, they like to be independent. They want their own everything. They want their own livelihoods. They want their own support systems so they don't have to deal with other people. <laughs> the Buddha says, don't do that. That's... I want you to remain physically dependent on the lay, lay community around you, 
And one main reason is, uh, is so they get a chance to practice generosity, just to interact. It's just the nature of humans uh, to, to close up with only your little group, and perhaps you, you practice generosity within that, but quite often it's just a matter of negotiations. But others outside of that, you don't practice generosity. So the Buddha said, you know, it's an enlivening, it's an enriching, it's a socially progressive idea to allow people to offer generosity to people who you don't know, to strangers. And so throughout my life, I've received a, virtually every day of my life, I've either received food from people, some often from people I've never met before, or I've gone hungry. <laughs> and surprisingly, after 32 years, I probably missed about four or five days. So the Buddha puts you in this situation where you must be a, a, an elegant receiver of generosity. But it's very easy, especially in a, in a culture that is used to this, for the monk to kind of to feel that they should be respected and they, they must receive these things. And so it's very easy to uh, get their, their attitude to get out of, um, out of what the Buddha intended. So that this is uh, something also in your, in your interactions with other people at, at work or in your family or in all the social situations is like, keep reflecting and asking yourself, you know, am I, am I getting imperious? Am I getting too proud? Am I getting too bossy? What are my expectations? Am I becoming entitled? One has to rethink these things. So this is uh, what one must do is to reevaluate your situation and to go back to what we talked about before, humility. So not proud and demanding in nature, so the monk should walk through the village in a very orderly fashion, serene fashion, with a heart of goodwill, loving kindness. And as I say, they're not begging, they're actually doing this as a service. And I, when I was in Thailand, I, I saw this many times, it takes a while for, I think, for a Westerner, a Western monk to catch on to the real meaning of this, the alms rounds. But sometimes we, the forest monks, we'd be invited to uh, go to the major cities like Bangkok. And we stayed in people's, uh, places that people actually had built for monks to, to uh, have accommodation. And they would often be quite wealthy people who would invite the monks to stay at their place for a few days and uh, they would offer very nice food. But some, especially the Thai monks would go alms round uh, even though they had an option to just take a break and, and receive food offered to them in this way. At first I was a little perplexed. What, you don't like the food? <laughs> no, nothing to do with that. The food that was being offered was excellent. And, but they felt there is a duty to always make yourself available for this. This is the duty of the monk is to make yourself available to other people to expand their heart, their heart of generosity. And so this is something that one, one has to understand about this. So that, you know, you can extrapolate this to your own life as a lay person your own uh, your own loving relationships with others require you to be the recipient sometimes. You, lots of people like always to be the giver, but uh, that's a power position, you know that? Uh, can you let go of the power stuff and just be a recipient? Can you be realize that other people like to give as well and you need to be a graceful receiver of these things? This is a, relationships are both, you know, the joy of giving and the, and the, the love of receiving, you know, it's not love of getting things. It's the love of being open to others' generosity. 
and to realize that it enhances their life as well. And some people are really good recipients. They're really good. And others are they're just very uptight. They're they're afraid to be a recipient. They don't like this and all that kind of stuff. But that's it's a it's a lack of understanding about the nature of uh, interactions. So we are finally to the last little line here. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. This is uh, what is called hiri otapa, high concern with your own well-being, and that's why you are actually a moral agent. Because without a sense of strong morality, you cannot be well. You cannot uh, achieve it. People try all the time. They think they can steal and do this and that, and they'll, they're going to be happy. And no, 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 they just don't understand. There's little law in the mind. And it's what's behind what we call morality. It's what's behind virtue. And this, the true motivations behind virtue is a, is a lack of anger and a lack of greed, a lack of conceit. This is what's behind the sila, the virtue. And so one cannot be happy without those. And so one takes care of oneself now and in the future by understanding the value of one's own virtue and being careful to uphold it. And then the second one is to have a consideration for the opinion of the wise. So this is what the sutta is saying. Uh, very high regard. Part of the development, the basis for loving kindness is that you have a very high regard for the opinion of the wise. And I would just say that those who do not hold loving kindness in high esteem are simply not wise. I, it doesn't matter what philosophy or religion they have, if they do not admire this, if they reject this, as a sterling quality of humanity, then no wisdom. So you're, you're interested in what the wise think about your behavior, and you're, you're very concerned about, and you ask yourself again and again, what would the wise think? And hopefully you have met some, somebody who's wise, and you have a sense, and if you haven't, then at least you've met them in a book, <laughs> and you think, what would Gandhi think? What would what would Tolstoy think, perhaps? What you know, any of these, any of these wise figures that you perhaps have personally never met, but you're impressed with, you ask them what would they do, and what would they think of your behavior? So this is this is these are uh, these are actions that that allow you to free the heart for this influx of loving kindness. So we have come to the end of this kind of preliminary instruction. And this is, as I say, it's very important to understand that this was given directly to monks. And that monks also are given regular talks by the Buddha. He talks about giving up grudges and behaving yourself in this. So the, the monks are not beyond this or above this. The fact that they're in the robes is that they're expected to do this to a very high level and that they must be very, very careful that there are certain things that they can not do, which are not necessarily immoral and which lay people can do, uh, but are simply not okay for monks. So the monk is, uh, is getting the benefit of the, of support in the robes and the benefit of the instruction and the, and the, the company of the Sangha, but they also have to perform in some ways at a much more demanding level uh, with special considerations. But nevertheless, the Buddha says, you know, it doesn't mean just put on the robes does not mean you're free from greed, hatred, and delusion. You're just on a kind of a the fast track for that. So you can benefit from this. So just like an amateur musician plays the same pieces that a professional musician does, 
but maybe you don't have to play on stage at Carnegie Hall or you're not playing in the Boston Symphony Orchestra and conductor expecting that, that the first violinist is gonna play this perfectly. You're gonna have different demands on you depending on what, what your lifestyle is, but you can all participate in this and benefit in all kinds of different ways. So finally we get to what loving kindness is. And it is simply this, the wish that all beings may be well and safe. So this is, this is interesting because you remember that the, the origin story has this, they're in a situation, the monks are in a situation where there's kind of an, there's an animosity towards them. There's a, a rejection of them. And the Buddha is sending them back in there. Of course, this is not just mild, you know, you're, if you're a, a monk in a forest, as I say, especially in the fifth century, but even to this day, I've been in forests, you're, you're, monks have no protection. You might be sitting under a mosquito net if you're lucky, and you're you're sleeping in the, the midst of the great forest. You know the, these are forests are filled with animals. Uh, I don't know whether you've had the pleasure of encountering a wild elephant, but especially in the middle of the night, <laughs> it's pretty overwhelming. Or say you know a twenty-five foot long constrictor, or a cobra or all the other things that are poisonous and chemical, uh, have chemical defense structures or are very aggressive. This is the world, this, this teeming world that you're being uh, presented with. And also perhaps you have one just little flickering candle <laughs> to deal with, get through the 12 hour night of the tropics in the deep jungle. In order to do that, you need to cultivate this loving kindness and what you wish to them is what you get. So what is it that you're asked to wish? May all beings be well, happy, peaceful, and safe. And it's what you radiate out that comes back to you as well. So this is your, what monks can take to the forest. We have a few chants that we do that are called paritas or um, protective chants. And there are specifically uh, naming kind of creatures. May all beings with uh, four legs be well, happy, and peaceful. May all beings with many legs be well, happy, and peaceful. Do you know what the many legs are? Have you ever seen a centipede a foot long? <laughs> They're about this wide and a foot long. They move very fast and they have an incredibly poisonous bite. And when they feel the tread of your foot on the ground, they, they often act very aggressively towards you and they, they pinch into your, into your ankle. And it's like the bite of 10 wasps. So you really want to be on good terms with your centipede friends. <laughs> These are tropical centipedes. And it's not that unusual in the forest. I've had many encounters with such beings. And all beings with no legs. Wow, what being has no legs? Snakes. And they come in every kind of variety, from the massive constrictors that are 25 feet long to the, to the little ones that are no thicker than your little finger and they're called two steps why why are they called two steps because after they bite you you make two steps and then you're dead <laughs> they're incredibly poisonous and you're you're living in the midst of this so how, the it's a strategy a normal human reaction to this is to is to protect yourself heavily and to be very angry at all of these beings and try to dominate them and et cetera, terrify them. This is not the right attitude. Monks have a very good record of actual survival. Uh, considering how much time we're spending in the forest in a completely unprotected way, very few occasions of, of, of uh, great aggression 
from the animals towards the monks. Some monks are not so good at this. They can get very nervous or sometimes they forget to practice their loving kindness. And they or sometimes you get overconfident where you think that you're going to be able to walk up to any being and just pet it on the head. You know, that doesn't always work that way. That's something to do with humility as well. Like understand loving kindness is very important, but don't get carried away here. So having been in those situations many times with many monastic comrades and also with lay people, you know, uh, this is eventually you come to trust this attitude and you see that there is some, this uh, relationship. So loving kindness also has a protective effect for your, for you. And so it is not something that is just simply of benefit to others. In fact, of course, the main benefit will be to you. Some people ask me, you know, if we radiate loving kindness to these people, etc., will will they all, do they feel it? It's a, maybe not. There's no guarantee that people feel these waves, especially if they're not in the same room with you or they can't read your expressions. Some people are unable to uh to know even know what that is. But you will feel it. I guarantee 100% every single time whenever you do indeed genuinely generate loving kindness, you will feel it. And this is a bit of a trick because if you don't feel it, it's not loving kindness. Because loving kindness is a feeling and it's one of the most sublime and beautiful feelings. So you get the benefit every single time. And any other being that is sensitive to this, that is open to this, will also benefit and they will be assisted. So all you got to do is think about being in a room with somebody that is, you feel profound, uh, no threat to you. You feel safe with them. You will see that it's very easy to, to uh, reflect that back very easy. You are also pulled into their field. Now, if you want to understand this, try the opposite. Just be in a room where people are physically threatening or aggressive or want to steal things from you or take advantage of you. Just try it sometime. You'll feel, you will take on the same kind of attitudes versus profound friendship where you can trust a person with your life. Everything not, you, you, you can go to sleep in their presence and you will wake up protected. So this is the beauty of loving kindness. It would be a very terrible existence if this was not known. If you had to live in a social structure where this is simply not known, that it's every person for themselves and you take what you can and by devious means, etc., which is... Um, there are a substantial portion of the population living in those situations. That's a terrible situation to be in. And part of your wisdom is to remove yourself from situations like that. And this is my own loving kindness advice to you. Better to go alone than with a fool for company. Now the fool is this person who has no acquaintance with loving kindness, has nothing but selfish intent. That is not somebody you need to be with out of kindness for yourself. If you have to face your life alone, do it. <laughs> and compensate for that and support yourself with loving kindness. You will feel that you do not actually need all that much company if you can generate this loving kindness it's wonderful in that case to be alone. Even when you're alone, if you have loving kindness, you are also connected intimately with all other beings. Just to the extent that you can radiate it out, you are not alone. And if you are in the midst of a lot of other beings and you can't generate any kind of goodwill, you will be deeply alone, alienated and lonely. So this is one of the things that you must examine in yourself and understand that if you can manage this uh, emotion of loving kindness, then uh, 
you dissolve a lot of the problems of modernity, which are essentially alienation, uh, loneliness, and the inability to, to connect. So this is, this is a great treasure. If you can understand this, practice this, you uh, have access to unlimited kind of treasure. <laughs>